Thank you all for coming to the CEO Technology Forum, Zoom and Beyond, socializing with emerging applications and platforms. We all have three presentations to share innovative Zoom use cases and experiences with new tools for communicating and interacting with colleagues and users. Our first speaker is Tana Jenkins, East Asian Study Librarian and creator of the Golden W. Branch Collection at the University of Maryland. As East Asian, Asian Study Librarian, she provides education, research, and collection support for studies related to China, Japan, and Korea. As creator of the Branch Collection, she assists with research and course integrated instruction focusing on the Allied occupation of Japan. She has a BA in English, MA in History, and MA in ML. MLIS from the University of Maryland. Our second speaker is Karen Howell, Associate University Librarian at the USC Libraries Teaching, Learning, and Research Engagement Division. Prior to that, she was head of Levy Library. Karen identifies and fosters partnerships of Levy Library with students and campus support groups, which have resulted in popular student outreach programs, such as Lunch and Learn with a Librarian for International Students. During the pandemic, Karen worked with campus partners to support students' mental and physical health concerns. This led to the creation of the today's presentation, Taudaro Study Cafe. Our third speaker is uh, Chiake uh, Sakai. Uh, she joined the CV Star East Asian Library at Columbia University as a Japanese Star Librarian in October 2019. Prior to that, she worked at the Library of the Japan Foundation Japanese Language Institute for three years and with the University of Iowa Libraries for 12 years. Her shorter stints at our libraries include two Japan Foundation libraries, as well as the Lama Library at uh, uh, Kapi, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce the name here, in, in Hawaii. She once worked as a library vendor employee in Japan too. Currently, she's chairing the Committee on Japanese Materials. So please join me in welcoming our three speakers to the forum. And uh, Kana, please take away. Okay, thank you, Tang. I'm going to share my screen. Oops. Can anybody see the screen? Yes? Okay. Thank you, Tang, for the wonderful introduction, and thank you, the Technology Committee, for organizing this panel. And of course, thank you, the OSIO members, for attending today. Again, my name is Kana Jenkins. I'm East Asian Studies Librarian and also the curator of the Golden Double Crown Collection at the University of Maryland Libraries. As you might have noticed, uh, I have two titles, one as a subject librarian for East Asian Studies, and others as one of the curators in a special collections. In this presentation, I will discuss one of the library sessions that I conducted in the spring 2021 semester, wearing a subject librarian hat. It was the middle of the COVID time and the classes at the University of Maryland was almost 100% virtual. As my presentation uh, title here suggests, I experimented using a Google Jamboard in a synchronous Zoom class as a way for the student to interact and work on a group project. The class in question was JAPN 42, Reading in Japanese Culture Studies. The class is designed for upper level Japanese language students, so at least three years of Japanese language classes was required. The overall class theme is aligned with this particular faculty member's research interest, which is a relationship between the technology and, and the human in the contemporary Japan. Very briefly, here is the flow of the class. I successfully embedded myself or brought the libraries into the class, classroom, as I like to call it, in the various stages of the class. I'm going to focus on what I did in the library uh, day number one in this presentation, where half of the day was about the concept mapping exercise, and the other half was the Asahi newspaper database instruction. But so as, you can, as you can see here, I attended both presentation and also had a follow-up library day later in the semester, where I did more in-depth research consultation with the student in a one-on-one breakout room. 
The final project for this class, final product rather, for this class was a WordPress uh, blog entry. So here is the uh, final WordPress blog. Uh, each student produced a bilingual blog entry for their research project. But as you saw in the previous slide, there are many steps before the student reach to this capstone project product. So now I'd like to get into the concept mapping exercise work, which is the main focus of this presentation. Some people call it as a mind mapping as well. So some of you might have heard it before. It is essentially the way to organize your thought and to put it, visualize it, put it in a visual map. I instruct the student to put their main concept in the middle of the blank paper, just like I did here in the PowerPoint, and then start putting related keywords around the main concept. They can link them as they want, or do this concept, I call it bubbles, but can be just floating around. I find this concept mapping is a good uh, method for students to start a research project because they, they can help, this really help them to expand uh, in many cases, narrow it down to their research topic into the research question. And secondly, it helps them to, it's a good chance for them to gather as many keywords as possible for their research. In my session, I ask students to come up with keywords both in English and Japanese. As you saw in the timeline slide, the class is half concept mapping exercise and they have Asahi newspaper database instruction. Um, Asahi newspaper is one of the uh, biggest newspapers in Japan and the University of Maryland Library subscribe to its database. So the whole idea here is the student come up with as many keywords as possible, preferably in Japanese, in the concept mapping exercise, and then use these keywords in action in the Asahi newspaper database section in the second half of the session immediately after. So I started this uh, incorporating this concept mapping exercise in my library instruction session in the fall 2019, pre-COVID time. So that was a time when you know, I had no idea what Zoom was, and I gave out the piece of paper to each student to work on their own concept map. After five minutes, I asked them to circle around the maps, and each student was responsible to put at least two Japanese uh, keywords to their classmate concept maps. I'm just going to show you the one, the, this example a uh, concept map that I showed in the class. So this time I did the concept map on the idol, idol. After this class, I got the pretty good feedback from the faculty member that the student really enjoyed this group work aspect of the concept mapping exercise. Then, as you know, we entered the COVID time in the spring 2020, just about two years from today. Um, this faculty member offered the same class in the spring 2021. And I was asked to do the same concept mapping and asking in his paper database instruction um, again, but this time all virtual on the Zoom. So I tried to find a way to recreate experience from uh, in person from fall 2019 to the uh, moving into the uh, online um, platform. And uh, one day, one of my colleagues was listening to this uh, presentation, told me about the Google Jamboard, and I decided to experiment with it. So here is a Google Jamboard concept map that I showed to the class in the spring 2021 as an example. And you can see from the previous slide, it's essentially the same. The concept of the concept map exercise is the same. It's all virtual now. So for those of you who may haven't used the Google Jamboard before, it is essentially one of the Google's uh, applications, just like Google Doc or the Google Spreadsheet. And when you open up the Google, you can click these nine dots on the upper right corner, and then you can, you're going to find the Jamboard uh, app icons there. When you click the uh, new Jamboard, as you see, it's essentially the blank virtual whiteboard. Um, but you find this uh, icon on your left, and with them, you can put all these text, sticky notes, images, shapes, and text box just like you would do it with a regular whiteboard. Okay, so now I'd like to get into the details of how the session was conducted. First, as a preparation for the Zoom session, I provided a short video uploaded to the YouTube, explaining three things. What is concept mapping exercise? How to do it? And how to navigate the Google Jamboard? 
As you see here, it was only a little bit over five minutes video, which had a better chance that student would actually do it before the class. And I also created the, uh, every student Jamboard and shared them to everybody in the class, including the faculty member. On the day of the session, first, the students were given about five minutes to work on their own concept map. Then the students were divided into the two breakout rooms. I believe there are four students each. And then just like the in-person class session, they were asked to, to add at least two Japanese keywords in their breakout room classmates Jamboard. The faculty member and I first did out for the breakout rooms to give the student to work on their uh, concept maps, but we were able to monitor every board. We had eight tabs open. And then the faculty member joined the breakout room A, I joined the breakout room B. After a while, we switched, and both of us left a bit early to give the student to wrap up. And then everybody came back to the main room, main Zoom room, and then we all did a search in NASA newspaper database, the second half of the session. So this is one of the student jumper. This student was interested in a wearable technology, like uh, checking the patient's vitals at the hospital. As you see, the students didn't really put that many Japanese keywords in the concept map, but I remember uh, they were able to expand the ideas and find the good articles. This student was interested in the use of the robots in assisted living facilities. I was very excited to see that they tasted this uh, image here. I'm gonna get into this a bit later in the slide, but one thing I didn't see it coming was the use of the images in a concept mapping exercise. I know the Google Jamboard, I know now the Google Jamboard is really good uh, accommodating this image uh, usage in there, but since it wasn't possible for the uh, paper-based concept map, I just didn't think about it. Here is the example number three, where the student used, also used the two images. When the students, uh, when the student first said the bio, cosmetics, or the cosplay as their um, research topic, I wasn't really sure where this research was going. Then I saw the student placing this image right here, and immediately I knew that they were looking more like a gender representation, um, gender issues in a virtual, um, platform with an anime. So I offer some of these keywords. I was able to offer some of the keywords in here. Okay, so now I'd like to get into the assessment of the class. Um, there are a couple of things that work well using a Google Jamboard when doing a concept mapping exercise. Uh, first, the Google Jamboard application is very easy to learn and use. I'm not sure if the students knew how to use a Google Jamboard prior to my video, but I noticed there's no student who had any technical or navigation issues during the Jamboard during the session. And secondly, I noticed that the students were casually adding or the deleting of keywords in each other Jamboard. And this could be because they might have felt more comfortable typing Japanese as opposed to writing them down. And also they might have found it easier to look up some Japanese word with online dictionary and copy and paste them in the Jamboard. Then, as I mentioned earlier, the use of the image was a big hit, both for me and for the students. I think it gave more dimensions to their concept maps, gave better, more like clarifying ideas what their research interests are, and they seem to work to foster more engaging conversations among the students. So overall, I was pretty happy with how the using the Jamboard facilitated the group work, even in a Zoom setting. Now, of course, there are some drawbacks that I noticed, which might have been sort of common for any online teaching. Uh, for example, it was hard to see the student engagement level, especially when there's no move for a while in the Jamboard, and then when they had the cameras off. And secondly, I noticed that one breakout room was more active in conversation and contribution to the, each other's Jamboard than the others. And the faculty member and I couldn't really mend that even after both of us, both of us this did the, uh, this breakout room. So as I mentioned earlier, I did this class now three times, right? Pre-COVID time, in person, in fall 2019. And then during the COVID time, on the Zoom in the spring 2021, which is the focus of this presentation. And then third time, I actually did it again this semester, uh, spring 2022, a couple of weeks ago, back in person. 
I think this really aligns with the main theme of this CEO meeting, thinking the new post-pandemic normal, right? So doing this class three times, all in a different unique situations, give me a chance to receive a constructive uh, suggestion from the faculty members, and also a chance for me to analyze and really cherry pick what works well for this class uh, from now on. So I had some keepers from my spring 2021 class here. First, providing a short video explaining what is the concept math exercise uh, really was really helpful since I could jump into the activity, activity part as the student already know what it is and when we meet in person. And secondary, this flow of the concept map at the first half of the session, get the Japanese keywords in there and then use it uh, immediately after in the second half of the session in the newspaper database instruction also works very well. And lastly, this uh, collaborative, collaborative aspect of the concept mapping exercise seems a big hit among the students, both in person and also online using a Google Jamboard. So that is all from me for today. Thank you very much. I look forward to the uh, questions. Thank you so much, Kana. That's a really in innovative use case of uh, case of using Jumbo, Google Jumbo with the language studies. So uh, Ka Karen, please take away. Okay, thank you so much, Tong. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm excited to share with you a way to create a virtual study environment for students using Zoom and other tech tools. I'm gonna cover four um, sections. Uh, the purpose of creating a virtual study environment, how we planned a Pomodoro study cafe to uh, make an instance of a virtual study environment, how we created it using Zoom and some uh, tips and lessons that we learned and how we're gonna to adapt to our changing environment. So first, uh, the purpose of a virtual uh, study environment. Uh, like the rest of the world, uh, we uh, realized in late summer of 2020 that fall 2020 was going to be a virtual semester. Uh, up until the very last minute, we thought that perhaps we might have a hybrid semester, uh, but it was not meant to be at USC uh, with the surge and the health conditions. I saw in the student newspaper postings that students were feeling very isolated, unable to focus, experiencing high levels of stress and concerned about their mental health. These are some photographs that the student newspaper solicited from students about how their living conditions were as they were trying to study. Uh, this was the impetus uh, for uh, me to focus on creating a virtual study environment to foster a sense of connection, even though, uh, like the student paper said, they were physically restricted, but they wanted to be distantly connected. I looked at our um, USC Libraries mission and was inspired by this section uh, where we talked about the libraries advancing a vibrant, inclusive library environment for intellectual and creative achievement. And I thought, what is the difference uh, in us creating an environment versus a one-time event? Uh, it boiled down to me that we wanted to create an environment that provides ongoing support and structure uh, that would be designed to foster behaviors in students that they were seeking. So the support and structure of the virtual study environment was to help students learn by experiencing positive behaviors and building support in a community of scholars. Of course, nobody can do everything by themselves. So in addition to wonderful collaborators within the library, I also worked with uh, previous collaborators um, that I had with various campus partners on campus. So our cross campus planning resulted in a virtual library environment that we called a Pomodoro Study Cafe. So what is a Pomodoro Study Cafe? I designed the virtual environment based on two concepts. 
I won't say that I knew that at the beginning, I felt more as if we were designing or reacting to uh, what we saw the students' needs were and what we thought we could bring to the situation. First, uh, we had the concept of creating mindful study sessions based on the Pomodoro technique, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. The second concept was um, creating a virtual cafe um, concept where students can gather in a third space. In general, the third space um, is their home or where they're living. The second space was their classroom or the university where they could no longer um, interact in person with their colleagues or with us librarians. Uh, when they were on campus, a third space often was um, the library. Uh, in the work world, a third space often is something like a Starbucks um, coffee. You go to a cafe to hang out, to study, to read, to meet friends. So the virtual cafe would provide a third space during the pandemic where they could gather with virtual strangers and develop a sense of belonging, even when they're not directly interacting with each other. We started with a small pilot program in fall 2020 at the end of the semester. And based on student demand, when we saw that spring 2021 would also be a completely remote semester, we expanded the Pomodoro Study Cafe to run all semester long, four nights a week, Monday through Thursday from eight to 11 p.m. This was only possible because I had um, help from great library staff members uh, who were willing to work evening hours, 8 to 11 p.m. Uh, and it was helpful for them because they had family and schooling um, obligations, childcare obligations during the day. So it was a win-win for the students and for our library employees. The Pomodoro Method is a time management system developed by Francesco Cirillo in the 1980s when he was a university student in Italy. He used a kitchen timer to help him go through a sequence of focused work and breaks. Since he was in Italy, his kitchen timer was shaped like an Italian tomato, uh, which was called a Pomodoro, thus the Pomodoro method or Pomodoro technique. Here are the five steps for using a Pomodoro technique. Step one, pick a task to focus on. Step two, Set a timer for 25 minutes and work only on that task. Step three, when the timer goes off, reset it for five minutes and take a restorative break. This step is crucial for your being able to work with focus, take care of your physical needs and not burn out over long study sessions. Step four, you repeat this sequence, 25 minutes study, five minutes break. Each 25 five sequence is one Pomodoro session. So step five, after you complete four sessions, which take approximately two hours, reward yourself with a longer break. So to keep things interesting, we also raffled off $5 Starbucks gift cards every hour during one of the breaks. Using the Pomodoro method for the virtual study environment gave students structure and tools to learn positive behaviors by experiencing them instead of just reading about it. They learn to manage distractions by breaking overwhelming tasks into bite-sized pieces 25 minutes at a time. They learned how to prevent burnout by taking self-care breaks. They learned to decrease stress by focusing on one thing at a time. And they felt productive, productive by making progress on their tasks. So let's talk about using Zoom and other tools to create a Pomodoro study cafe. Here's an overview of the tools we used. and the next few slides, I'll give you some tips. We use Zoom to host the virtual library study sessions and to communicate with students using chat. We used uh, the timer that's built into the smartphone to time the 25 minute study sessions and five minute breaks. To raffle off the $5 Starbucks gift cards every hour, we used the virtual wheel spinner at wheelofnames.com. And to collect the students' information to enter the raffle, we used a Google form. 
uh, one of our staff members added an optional question at the end of the raffle form so that if students chose it, they could see a terrible joke of the day. And that turned out to be an unexpectedly popular feature. For using Zoom, uh, some of the things we discovered were we set up our sessions um, as a recurring session so that students could add these dates to their calendar and get automatic reminders. We did require um, registration, restricting it to USC students to avoid Zoom bombing. Uh, since we were working at home and students were studying at home, uh, we were um, vulnerable to electrical or network disruptions. So in Zoom, we set up alternative host names so they could keep the sessions live if the primary host had issues, which did happen to us. We had electrical storms uh, during the uh, spring semester and got, um, our hosts got knocked off, but we were able to keep the session going. We set a chime that only the host could hear so whenever somebody joined the session, we would know and we were able to ensure that we connected with the students and greeted them personally by private chat. The tricky question of having cameras on or off, uh, we went back and forth and we decided to encourage students to turn their camera on if they chose to, but we didn't require it. We ourselves kept uh, the cameras on so that they felt a connection. They could see a person from the university and the library and see us night after night and start developing uh, a feeling that they knew somebody during this time of isolation. Uh, using the timer, we just used the built-in timer on the phone, but even that required a bit of fine tuning. The sound needed to be loud enough so at the end of the five minute break, if they were in the kitchen grabbing a drink of water, they could hear it and come back to their uh, laptop so they could start the next study session. At the same time, it couldn't be so loud that it would disturb others or um, at the end of a study session that it would startle students. Uh, students weren't shy to tell us if they thought some sounds were sounded too grating or too squawky. And through experimentation, we ended up on a sound that worked okay. Wheelofnames.com is a fun way to make raffles transparent. Our hosts pasted the student names onto the list on the right-hand side. Uh, the, uh, the website then populates the name onto the wedges of the circle. When you click on the wheel, it starts spinning and it has great sound effects as it chooses uh, the winner. It also deletes the winner's name from the screen afterwards. So the next time you spin, uh, you only are spinning for the students left uh, that had not won in the raffle. We used a Google form uh, for the students to enter the raffle uh, and also for us to collect uh, information that we could use to analyze our attendance and demographics. Uh, we thought of it as a raffle form, but the students experienced it as a sign-in sheet. They wanted accountability to show that they had attended. Uh, a lot of them came, they wanted to see the evening's terrible joke of the day, a little bit of serendipity, a little bit of um, light in their endless day uh, made them a little bit of laughter. Some people submitted uh, terrible jokes and they wanted to see if theirs was the one that was selected for that evening. Uh, the tip about setting up a Google form is think ahead of time about what kind of demographics you might want to track uh, so that you collect the information from the beginning. We created a new tab for each session so we could look at the data by session or uh, across the semester. So throughout the pandemic, like everybody else, we've continued to adapt to our environment that seems to change every week. Sometimes it felt every day. Sometimes if we were fortunate, it didn't change for a couple of weeks. But after experiencing an all remote spring semester, we did transition to an in-person campus, um, on-campus fall semester. So in fall 2021, when students returned to campus, um, our student workers are telling me they were calling themselves FOC. And I asked what that meant. First time on campus, they were sophomores, but they were FOCs. So they wanted to experience the physicality of the campus experience. They were tired of being on Zoom all the time. 
What we did with the Pomodoro Study Cafe then is instead of running a standalone virtual environment all semester long, we integrated it into our in-person end of semester study on program. So this was a combination of uh, wellness workshops and Pomodoro Study Cafes all held in person in our library classroom. But since not all of our students were in person, for the distance learning students and students on the medical campus on the other side of town, we enhanced our live guide with resources to links, showing them how to do their own Pomodoro study sessions and giving them links to videos of restorative breaks that our campus partners had developed. As a result, we think that we can carry the Pomodoro Study Cafe concept through a virtual um, and in-person um, environments as we move along. So I hope that this has given you some ideas to create your own session. We have found it very helpful uh, for students who are graduate students, students who are pre-med or medical students, software engineering students, uh, students who uh, don't really um, have necessarily a voice when they're in person, but feel more comfortable. Uh, perhaps they're a little bit more introspective and want to communicate online. So thank you very much for um, inviting me uh, to present on this. I will end with a quick uh, comment from one of our students who sent me this through LinkedIn, uh, that she felt that the Pomodoro study session gave her the confidence uh, that she could succeed as a doctoral student and complete writing her dissertation uh, and thanked us for making her part of a community of scholars. Thank you so much, Karen. Yeah, Pomodoro Cafe, uh, Study Cafe was really popular during the pandemic and several of our students in Chinese studies attended and they, they all love it. So our third speaker, Nchiaki, please take away. Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Chiaki Sakai, Japanese studies librarian at the CV Star East Asian Library of Columbia University. I'm currently chairing the Committee on Japanese Materials. In this role, I planned and hosted a few online socials with my committee members and EB colleagues last year. And today I would like to talk about the events and software we used. This is the third time we are attending the virtual CU annual meeting. When the CU EB discussed the meeting format, we were well aware that our annual meeting is not only about attending sessions and workshops. However, during the CU 2021, Shigem Happy Hours was the only meeting outside of the official SEAL program providing socialization opportunities in our field. I believe all of us quickly realized that we need extra effort to make up with these missed opportunities for communication and networking. Do you know that we were already talking about Zoom fatigue in April 2020? Soon more people stopped turning on their camera as it was one of the recommended ways to deal with it. And not all of us use profile photo and or full name when attending those meetings. During the business meeting yesterday, I counted how many people are having their profile photo and affiliation information up. Among 104 participants, only one third of us had a profile photo and seven colleagues included their affiliation information. You know, we welcomed a few new colleagues at the meeting. Not all the events allow us to use direct chat to say hello to each other either. When the events are a combination of presentation and discussion session, we may leave the Zoom after the talk. Online conferencing tools like Zoom helps us overcome some distance and now we can attend more virtual events and meet with people in China, Japan or Korea more easily. But spontaneous encounters and conversations with new and different colleagues do not happen like before at those Zoom meetings. We have been using Zoom, not just at work. I hosted some private Zoom get-togethers as well. However, although those were casual meetings for fun, I started feeling the similar frustrations I had for Zoom meetings at work. Using Zoom, only one person can talk at a time. So we tried breakup rooms. 
host needs to manage them, and participants are not able to interact with a specific person or group freely or privately. I also did not like being confined to a square box in a gallery view. Although those faces are my friends and close colleagues, it still added some Zoom fatigue. I kept hosting those get-togethers even with those shortcomings. I felt that all of us were craving for more communication when dealing with uncertainties under the pandemic. I first learned about proximity or spatial chat software at East Asian Digital Scholarship Community Hour offered by the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies of Harvard University in January 2021. Around the same time, I heard from a Princeton colleague that their departmental meeting used software called Spatial Chat. This junk was rapidly growing under the COVID-19 pandemic to solve some of the challenges I mentioned in the previous two slides. Here are some examples, gather, spatial chat, and wonder. As you see, the use cases all include socials or party activities. Like wonder website says, virtual events are great. They are easy to organize, fast to set up, and no one needs to leave the house but they've always been missing the special something. There's no serendipity, no flow, no chance to meet someone new. With wonder, we want to help people share real experiences, creating spaces that always feel personal, no matter how many people are joining, where it is completely effortless to connect and interact. Gather Town Special Chat Wonder and other similar services, they all offer good introductory and tutorial resources on their website. Some of them also offer a demonstration session where you can join to test their product. Gather Town uses cute avatar icon and role playing game like background. It may be fun to use among close friends and colleagues. The NCC chose Wanda for their 30th anniversary and fourth ticket conference reception. So some of us already experienced it at first hand. Attending the event, I thought Wanda works nicely for those coupling talk presentation programming with socialization activities. Hosts have a, a control over switching the center stage mode for presentation to socialization mode. Wanda creates a circle for each breakdown group while social, uh, spatial chat uses proximity among the participants to form a group. Uh, Wanda's design probably works better audio-wise when the breakdown group size gets bigger. Here are some points why I recommended special chat among many choices for CJM and SEAL socials. It is equipped with basic functions that Zoom offers like sharing documents, chat, setting suitable for webinar type event, etc. It doesn't require participants to create an account to join. One SEAL social working group member pointed out the importance of this point. One CJM member and one working group member had a prior experience attending a special chat event. These tools were still work in progress, but special chat looked quite stable. Special chat also had a generous free plan for medium-sized group gathering and a monthly subscription plan economical enough for one or two events. Spatial chat is not a perfect tool. Considering its use for different kinds of events, I wish that it would eventually acquire some more functions. For example, recording feature is now available for the stage setting, but for other settings, recording requires the use of a third party service. Getting participant information is not that easy. Zoom provides you meeting participants list for your post event reports and so on. A special chat doesn't. You need to manually count and record the information during the events. When writing up the event reports for the COEB, I really wish the function was available on special chat. Although the event itself can be a casual one, registration step seems to be inevitable. At this point, it doesn't have a waiting room function. I see they have been making changes to improve the security features you still may not want to share the event link openly on this service. Now, I'd like to make a brief report on the CJM and SEO socials. 
The CJM Social was hosted on May 17, 2021 with the help of CJM members. We had 31 registrations. 27 colleagues signed up online and four registrations were made by email contact. The registration list was quite diverse, including Japanese and East Asian librarians, cat lockers, Korean studies librarian, East Asian library directors, electronic and continuing resources librarian, and early career librarians. I counted 23 colleagues in the space around 15 to 20 minutes into the event. Librarians are very serious people, so although the event was for fun and socialization, we had a few themes to help people form and find a conversation group. One colleague contacted Pryo to the event and asked if she could use the event to gather information from colleagues for her future project. On the registration form, interest in Tadoku, extensive reading was expressed. That prompted me to contact two colleagues who hadn't registered, but would be great to have for the conversation. I believe several colleagues from the event joined the CJK Picture Book Club Sharon Domaya talked about at yesterday's CPS Lightning Talk session. The COEB discussed the possibility of hosting social events at one of its meetings last March. The discussion was picked up again after the CJM social. With the EB's approval, Hana created the working group enlisting Sanghun, uh, Fabiano, Joshua, and Brian. They worked with me for two CEO socials. Hannah also spared her busy time for the events. Thank you. Two socials were held on August 11th and 12th, 2021. We had 48 registrations. 45 were made online and three were by email contact. A suggestion was received to invite our retirees on the pre-event survey. Also after the first event, the seal treasurer notified me that we got a few new SEAL members since last March. I personally contacted these two groups and some of them joined the events. 19 plus colleagues joined the event on August 11th and 13 plus joined on August 12th. So around 32 people in total came to these socials. The number included working group members, so the event size wasn't particularly big, but I thought it was a kind of success when I saw somebody's face at the end of the event. When she first arrived, she looked very tired. As you know, we were all very busy last summer preparing for the reopening in fall semester, but the social seems to give her a bit of relaxing time. I also believe Others who came to the event enjoyed chatting with different colleagues as well. I would like to share some challenges I found after hosting three socials. The 2021 post-conference survey included a question to measure the interest in a virtual social gathering. Among 47 responses, 37% said yes, but 33% said no. The COEV voted whether or not to have the CO social as well. The idea was approved, but I don't think the enthusiasm level was that high. Many of us were feeling overwhelmed with our daily activities more than usual and experiencing serious Zoom fatigue, persuading ourselves to put down our work to meet and talk to our colleagues for fun became something not that easy under the pandemic, I'm afraid. Because of that, how to handle registration, outreach, and promotion prior to the event seems really critical for the event's success. Unfortunately, for security reasons, we cannot skip the registration step. However, personal and direct invitation worked very well to diversifying the group. Technical support is another key. Librarians are relatively tech savvy. However, it is important to encourage individual participants to familiarize themselves with the software in advance. There are many tutorial videos and things like that are available through the software website. During the event, we need everybody's help and enthusiasm to welcome new colleagues and colleagues from other fields as well. This way, we could meet new people and have spontaneous conversations among ourselves. 
The COT members kindly reviewed my PowerPoint draft. I received one comment asking if any of these tools could realistically make up for the absence of human interaction at least partially, if not entirely. Well, I would say yes and no to the question. Remember, these are just tools. It is entirely up to us to make them work. Unless the participants wish to communicate and interact with others or hope to meet new people or expand their network, these tools will be useless. It works exactly the same way like the actual human interactions. When the SEAL annual meeting is held on site and in person once again, we will have SEAL reception and dinner to socialize. However, without waiting for one more long year, I wish I will have a chance to meet and talk to my SEAL colleagues sooner. If I plan another CJM or SEAL social, will you come? Thank you. Thank you so much, Chiaki. I will definitely come. I, I went to the, one of the SEAL social sessions last year. It was really fun. So I hope you are also, many of you are also interested in that. Yeah, thank so, you. Um, Jean, can you take away for the Q&A? Of course. Um, give me just a second. Let me. There. All right. Um, thank you, speakers. Um, it was um, all presentations were very interesting. Um, I've especially was interested in um, learning more about the social spaces and using more technology in classrooms and things like that. So um, thank you all. So for, for now, if um, anyone has any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat and Lawrence will be able to get to them. Or if you would like to uh, speak directly to the speakers, please raise your hand and then we'll be able to um, uh, request an unmute and then we can go from there as well. Um, so in the meantime, while we wait, um, I do have some general questions for the speakers. Uh, so please don't mind me if I keep looking back and forth. I have a dual monitor and so <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> back and forth between them. Um, so uh, you guys, I mean, you guys are all using different sort of technologies in the presentations that you gave us today. Um, if you were to give one piece of advice um, to anyone who wants to implement the tech technologies, technologies mentioned, um, what would you tell them? Any of the speakers? <laughs> Well, okay, then I'll, uh, I'll say, um, well, you know, um, even if we can't use it well, or, you know, uh, it doesn't go well, we will learn something and we will acquire some new tool to, you know, for the future interaction and communication and collaboration. So go ahead. And because, you know, uh, this group is so, you know, a uh, tech survey and, um, you know, uh, resourceful. Uh, if you feel like you cannot handle the new software, you know, on your own, why don't you uh, drop a line, you know, on uh, East Leaf or, you know, Japan Leaf liaisons, please serve asking, do you want to work with me? I think that can be, you know, uh, helpful as well. I can pick next. Uh, one thing that I feel um, it's important, is, especially for my, um, the, the one that I did, uh, it, since it's a teaching, the communication with the faculty member was very important that I could learn from faculty members since that was sort of early on in the semester, but the faculty member knew the students, so how they work in the group settings. And so talking with them, talking with the faculty member beforehand and then work with her, work with them and see how this can be incorporated in the class was very helpful. So if some, if anybody would like to do this, um, I would say talk with the uh, faculty members first and see what their uh, goal in the class. Yeah, I would say that uh, technology is fun. That's why we always want to use it, right? I mean, 
but um, I think it, you think of it in conjunction with the problem you're trying to solve or the service you're trying to provide or what you're trying to do. So a lot of times you don't know everything before you start. I mean, you, you have a general goal, but you learn how to do it by doing it. And so all of the Zoom settings that I told you about, we learned by mistake because <laughs> as we were doing it, we started thinking, uh oh, you know, there's going to be a storm coming this week. <laughs> and our host is in an area where we're not sure he's going to maintain electricity. So you Google everything and then you learn about alternative hosts. I mean, you don't know this ahead of time. You learn by doing. And so keeping an open mind, I think, is good for ourselves to develop professionally and good for the students that we're working with because we're kind of modeling in a way how they, um, a positive way to work and grow. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, for sure, I think we're all very new to some of these technologies and we're so, I don't know about you guys, but I am very analog. <laughs> so um, when Chiaki said we're all tech savvy, I was like, I don't know about that, but I am also in that learning process. Um, we do have a question for Karen in the chat. Uh, why did you choose a session of 25 minute activities and five minute break in the Pomodoro Study Cafe instead of other time schedule? And uh, how many students did you have each night at the cafe? Okay, uh, the first uh, question is, um, is a good one because we were going back and forth. We decided that we should take the standard um, recommended length in Pomodoro Study Cafe because we were working with a group of students. I mean, if you're doing it on your own, you can do things like 50 minute study, 10 minute break, you know, one hour study, you know, 15 minute break, you can adjust it. But when you have a group of students coming in and out all night long, it would be kind of make you crazy <laughs> because you'd have a timer going off all the time and people would be getting confused on which set sequence you were in. 25-5 works well in an hour session because you can do 25-5, 25-5 and you have one hour. And students uh, somehow are socialized to think of one hour sessions, classes are in one hour. So we just went with that, but um, certainly it's, it's not wet in stone. Um, as far as being popular, yes, um, of course, when the first time we did it, I was scared. I thought, okay, I'm warning our staff members, what if nobody comes? It's okay, we'll hang out together. <laughs> but uh, that's the benefit of collaborating with other units on campus. They also had a vested interest in uh, reaching students. So we, instead of just the library publicizing, we had the um, Learning Center, Korshak Center for Learning and Creativity, we had the rec sports, we had student health and mental counseling, you know, all of the different groups that we worked with had their own uh, publicity channels. Uh, we started with 20 students, or was it 30 students the first night. Uh, during um, the fall, we averaged about 50 to 80 students. Um, and in the spring, when we did it four nights a week, so it was a steady appointment time, kind of appointment setting, uh, we would go sometimes over 100 students a night. It really depended. Yeah, we had over, when I did the statistics, we were well over a thousand students, well over a thousand students by the time we got to the end of the semester. Uh, like I said, what you ended up with, some students would show up once or twice, you know, they had a midterm to study for. But others working on their dissertations, studying for the medical entrance exams, um, doing software engineering projects, really uh, wanted the, um, they wanted the collegial support. I mean, they weren't best friends with people that they just saw names on on screen, but they started recognizing other people that were coming every night. Some of them split off and they started doing um, cross-disciplinary collaborations. So I think it has potential to be very popular. Great, right. thank you. Um... It's, it's fascinating to hear that more than 100 students were coming into a Zoom session to just study. Um, another question for Karen. Um, do you intend to continue both the virtual and in-person study cafe? And if yes, what motivates you and your library to do that? Yeah, well, this is um, tricky, right? Because as I was saying, you have to keep adapting to um, um, your environment. Uh, I want to continue it. Um, however, I think it needs a little bit of thought. During the pandemic, uh, we had staff that needed 
assignments to do when they're working from home and they had difficulty, like I said, with childcare during the day. So it was a nice fit for them to help us in the evening. Now that we're back on campus, uh, you know, they had their, um, <laughs> their regularly assigned duties in person to do. Uh, so I think it requires adaptation. I worked with some um, student workers that can work except that during finals and midterms and we we're trying to offer it, that's when they're asking you, I need to study <laughs> and I can't come to work. <laughs> so staffing becomes a bit of an issue. Uh, I'm thinking of perhaps looking uh, at uh, trying to get library school interns that might want some experience at um, hosting sessions and maybe doing some training that way. Uh, so Yes, the intention is to continue, but perhaps not in precisely the same way, just continue to adapt. All right, thank you. And the last question, I know this is for Karen as well, but I'm gonna open it up to the other speakers as well. Um, uh, would, you, <laughs> would you review your budgeting info and approval process when, per, when perhaps such unexpected spending was advised against during the pandemic. I'm just gonna open it up to just budgeting if there were any involved. Well, um, I see that my former supervisor Shala is here and my former associate dean uh, Ruth Wallach is here. So I want to thank them both for their support. Uh, it's actually not as um, expensive as you might think. After talking with our campus partners, we decided that um, $5 Starbucks gift cards would be a good incentive for students. Uh, at first I was thinking, oh, well, maybe $25, $100 or what. Uh, but, but, but with their experience, they said that in their outreach to students, students would get very discouraged because if you had one $50 gift card, um, and you had maybe 20 people there, you had like maybe a one in 20 chance of getting it. And so they were advising me, why don't you have lots of gift cards, lots of small gift cards? So you would be surprised. I thought $5 doesn't sound like much, but students really wanted the $5 cards. You know, you can get a special drink for $5 or you can get a snack for $5. And so, um, I don't know, maybe it's starving students. At any rate, uh, you can get a lot of cards for $5 each. So it's quite um, a reasonably priced uh, venture as opposed to if you were doing something on campus where you had to pay for a caterer or, you know, you had to buy other kinds of things. Uh, hope that helps. Any of the other speakers get into any budgeting? issues? No? All right, one, one last question. Um, have, you, have you received any feedback from your users um, about using the online technologies? I think some of you mentioned them at the end of your presentations, uh, but if you have any moments you would like to share. I guess I could um, do it quickly. Uh, we're all now accustomed to Zoom. I mean, when we first started, we didn't quite know how to, you know, set an environment in Zoom. But uh, somebody said it once, you know, one of our students said, well, it's interesting. We're all in this reality TV show together <laughs> because we all ended up in our own little <laughs> Hollywood square there. And they weren't interacting directly with each other. But even so, I think if the technology is used for a particular goal, it can work. And they did feel a sense of um, support and a sense of caring and a sense of belonging. Uh, I wouldn't say that it was a feature of Zoom. It's how you use it, I think. I didn't get the uh, specific uh, feedback towards using the Google Jamboard, uh, but I received a good feedback about the uh, concept mapping exercise in general. I think the group work aspect of it is really helpful for students to interact with each other and then get, you know, get familiar with each other. Uh, anything, Jackie? Um, 
my brain is fried by now. <laughs> I can't really think of any comments. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Chucky, for putting the, the link up for the spatial chat for people to use. So maybe if you guys are interested, you guys can move on to that website and have a little bit more of a social session. But mm -hmm. that's all. Oh, last one just came in fresh hot. Um, Kana, can you archive the activities of Google Jamboard? Um, do you mean like archive? By saying archive, you mean like have the Jamboard? connected like so you can view them anytime if that's the case yes it's just like a google doc so you can save it it's gonna live on your google cloud 